<laughs> okay, it's uh, time for us to do our our presentation here again. Uh, so far, we have done a number of presentations over the past on uh, on a variety of different topics relative to chronic pain and chronic conditions, and and Dr. Gates and I are going to continue on that path today. For those of you who have not seen us, uh, I'm Dr. Martin Rutherford. I am a uh, chiropractic physician and more importantly, well, as importantly to this talk, a uh, certified functional medicine practitioner. This is Dr. Randall Gates. Dr. Gates is a board certified chiropractic neurologist and um, between these two disciplines, we've managed to um, or we've been very fortunate, would even be a better way of putting it, to be exposed to a whole new world um, of um, chronic pain and conditions and a whole new world of approaches for those that kind of combine uh, alternative medicine but also utilizes different aspects of the medical community. And, and it's become the large part of our practice. Uh, probably 90% of my practice now is uh, is chronic pain and disease and probably 100% of Dr. Gates's practice is that. So together we have observed a lot of things. We are both, I, I, I particularly am a chronic pain patient. I have suffered from peripheral neuropathy, chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. Um, fibromyalgia has autoimmune components and today's topic is the different autoimmune issues. Um, different autoimmune disorders. I have Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune problem, and celiac, which is an autoimmune problem. There are obviously many more that we will allude to today. One of the uniquenesses that I think we're going to present is that in our world, all autoimmune problems will, will essentially be addressed as an autoimmune problem. There, it's not like mm -hmm. there, there are lots of different... Sjogren's doesn't have a different <clears throat> approach than right. Hashimoto's, right. than celiac, than, um, than MS, and, and or rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera, et cetera. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to share with you the clinical pearls that we have literally been uh, uh, fortunate to, to be part of a group of functional medicine doctors and functional um, uh, neurological doctors that have, have gotten together and, and, and helped to gain, I think, probably a greater understanding of these, of these uh, conditions. And, uh, and I think we, we may be part of a group that's setting the paradigm, that, that will be the paradigm in the future for, for what those of you who are watching may be suffering from or, or what your relatives may be suffering from. So. Um, do you want to add anything to my introduction there other than that I would add that there are 125 million chronic pain patients mm -hmm. um, out there in the world according to Stanford and Harvard um, and I think Harvard says 90 million I think Stanford says 120 million something like that and mm -hmm. uh, if our observations are correct the vast majority of them may have autoimmune problems mm -hmm. absolutely and the fact that those out there suffering with autoimmune disease that you know of, let's okay. say you have rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or Hashimoto's thyroiditis, we have some really neat stuff going on in the clinic. We just had a gal yesterday, you know, this isn't a plug for us, but I'm going to do it anyways. We had a gal yesterday, she's getting off her methotrexate with the cooperation of her rheumatologist, and now she's getting off of her Actimera. These are heavy-duty immune-modulating medications that she's able to get off of with the cooperation of her doctor, because the underlying causes, so to speak, of her autoimmune problem are now being addressed. So most people, so so <coughs> this is the treatment that most people are exposed to first. Um, the, the, the main model in this country for healthcare is the medical model. Uh, every week we emphasize we are not anti-medicine. We work with medical community, uh, as you just heard, on a ver variety of different levels, but it's usually, a, a, I mean, most of the treatment that is out there that is innovative and advanced for the autoimmune patient is not relative to drugs. Most of it is considered alternative. Uh, I'm not sure that that should be the case, uh, but most of it is considered alternative, uh, non-drug. And the medical community model is to suppress the immune system. Mm -hmm. To So first of all, for those of you who may be watching who 
uh, I'm not sure why you would be watching if you didn't know what an autoimmune problem was, but an autoimmune problem is at some point in time your immune system started to attack um, healthy tissue. I, I, you could say accidentally. Um, basically the immune system is designed to, most of you are familiar with it's designed to kill bacteria, it's designed to kill viruses, it's also designed to have a component to it that goes in and creates something called antibodies so that a lot of times when these things come back, uh, this virus or bacteria comes back, your immune system already recognizes it and kills it before you start to have a problem. That's a very, very, very thumbnail sketch of your immune system. And if that system suddenly goes awry or, or usually overstimulated, I think more than depressed, both can happen, but I think more overstimulated, uh, for example, my, uh, my uh, conditions, the, the Hashimoto's and the celiac, were set off by an overwhelming uh, uh, pneumonia infection, which I didn't take care of as well as I should have. And by the time I did get the antibiotics, which were very helpful, um, apparently there was a, my immune system was over-firing and it, and, and it started to attack accidentally healthy tissue. Um, and and we can get into that at great length. We can talk about this for a week, so I'm going to try to stay to the main topics here. The main thing I'm trying to say here is there's triggers. The triggers <clears throat> that we see usually are stress, this huge, big, big, overwhelming single stress, or a stress over a long period of time. We see a lot of stress from uh, uh, childhood abuse, mm -hmm. verbal abuse, sexual abuse. These are big stresses. They affect your immune system. Your immune system starts to accidentally attack other tissues. Um, we see it in childbirth. I, I, don't, I don't want to take too much time to go into the mechanism, but, but there's has a lot to do with the third trimester of pregnancy and transferring antibodies over to your child and then, and then maybe you know, having a lot of stress during the birth and it's traumatic and you have to heal from it and so on and so forth. But we see a lot of people, ah, I was just fine. I had my third child and my whole life fell apart. I put on weight, and never came back, my, I got tired, all of a sudden then I started having joint pains. Traumas, uh, we've seen it, we're chiropractors, I've been a chiropractor for 35 years, I've, I've seen it a lot after motor vehicle accidents, all of a sudden the person has a motor vehicle accident, they come in, next thing you know, they're hurting everywhere. Of course the insurance companies are going, they're faking it, we're looking at them going, no they're not faking it. They have developed fibromyalgia, we have seen fibromyalgia and polyarthralgia, my rheumatic, and all these be set off by a trauma because it fires up your immune system. Your immune system attacks a tissue. When it attacks that healthy tissue by accident, it becomes genetic. It sets off something called a polymorphism in your unexpressed DNA. So, so we used to think that we came with our DNA. And that was it. Now we know two-thirds of it, I think, is, is kind of set in stone, and a third of it can be affected by a lot of things. It can be affected by the way you think. It can be affected by toxins. It can be affected by your immune system changing it. Um, this is like a fact, okay? So we have these triggers. There's more. There's other triggers. But we have these. Usually there's going to be a trigger. Usually there's going to be a genetic component to it. Not always, but most of the time. Uh, my, my parents had thyroid, my mother had thyroid problems, my aunt, my uncle had uh, multiple sclerosis and so on and so forth. So, so my pneumonia set that off in me. So this is an autoimmune problem and, 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 and the immune system can attack a lot of different tissues and you jam in anytime you want mm -hmm. here but I'm just mm -hmm. trying to set the thing up. Absolutely. So it's, uh, it, and, and our observation has been that now we, we've had, you know, MS, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Sjogren's, uh, Crohn's, um, I mean there's a myriad of diseases and they seem to be defined by the tissue that is attacked. Interestingly enough, what we find, the, the tissues we find that get attacked the most frequently seem to be the thyroid, the gut, the cerebellum. Cerebellum has a lot to do with if you suddenly develop dizziness and vertigo and balance out of nowhere, your ears are, are correct. Uh, cerebellum, uh, joint tissue, and muscular tissue seem to be like the so big five. Absolutely. And interestingly enough, most people are more familiar with the MS and the and, and Lou Gehrig's disease and lupus. And, and and everything we talk about will be relative to those also. Because as I stated before, one of the points we're the two the points I want to make today is um, 
autoimmune problems are autoimmune problems. It's just that they're, they're given different names depending on the tissue that they attack with the proshrim. Alternatively, I, I, I want to say it, it's, it's the same in that your approach is to calm down the immune system as opposed to, alternatively, I know a lot of people are attacking uh, the specific tissue um, as opposed to attacking the immune system in general. So if a patient comes in to us with rheumatoid arthritis and they come in with an autoimmune attack on their thyroid, there's a, there's a structured protocol to follow to determine which of many, many different things, which is what we're going to discuss, are causing their immune system to fire up and attack that tissue. It's probably the first time you're ever going to hear anybody who's, or, or you're ever going to hear an approach that's actually getting to the causes. And I say that not cavalierly because I had these, so I've been through what you've been through, and I've had a lot of people tell me, oh, <laughs> take this, it's getting to the cause, and take that, it's getting to the cause, and it wasn't. The cause was beneath that. We're going to talk about those things. And the other thing I want people to understand is, and I, and I, and I want you to understand this, to save you time and effort and money and whatever this is going to cost you. If you're going from doctor to doctor, whether they're doctor and the medical model or the alternative model, and, and, and each one has a unique approach. Some are going to tell you, oh, it's all parasites. Some people are going to tell you, oh, it's candida. It flares that up. If I, you're going to go to the colonic person. I'm not anti-colonics, okay? I did colonics for a long time when I was an intern in college. In, 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 in chiropractic college, so I understand the value of a colonic, but you know there's the argument of the colon's dirty, and then it affects the immune system. Does if you get a colonic, it's going to fix your it's going to fix your problem. So there's a lot of theories out there. The the addressing autoimmune problems in the medical field is pretty straightforward. You use the different drugs, they crush the immune system. Those of you who are doing that know there are a lot of side effects to that. If you don't know that there's anything else to do, I understand the trade-off is probably, mm -hmm. you know, good. I mean, if you're out of pain, you feel better, uh, but, you know, the steroids and these, and these uh, significant drugs, it, they extract their toll on the body as they must. There is, I think, a better way. At the very least, there's an alternative way. But that alternative way is a little bit more complex than I, sometimes it's presented uh, by uh, many of my colleagues out there who all are alternative practitioners who are kind of single-minded or dogmatic today there's all get off of gluten that'll do it it can be helpful uh, fix your leaky gut that'll do it and all of these things have merit but they don't all have merit for all patients and thus our mantra in the functional medicine field is treat the patient not the diagnosis because you can have a hundred people come in here with an autoimmune thyroid called Hashimoto's, an autoimmune attack on a thyroid, which is extremely common. And if you're out there and you have fibromyalgia, and you may not be watching this because you probably haven't figured out yet that fibromyalgia has an autoimmune component to it, but if you were watching it, then you would, I would say for every one of you, there's going, most every fibromyalgia patient that's ever walked in here has had Hashimoto's. I mean, I can't think of one who hasn't, frankly. Very, very common. Yeah, and, 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 and so they have an autoimmune problem, and, and so that would put them in the category of, I could have 100 people come in here with fibromyalgia, and the approach might be slightly to significantly different for each one of them. So it's a long time I spent setting that up. It's like 15 minutes, and I, I hope I didn't lose you. I don't think I would have lost you, because if you're suffering one of these, uh, conditions. These are the things I hear of every day in the consultations, and these are the these are the aspects that confuse a patient on 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 how to how is there is there an approach to stop the disease from uh, progressing and reversing it to uh, either a mild or significant degree. There are um, if your tissues are still recruitable, if they can still respond. Yes, there are. Can it be done without drugs? Yes, it can be, but it's complex. And so we're going to spend the next 45 minutes mm -hmm. discussing those complexities. And my guess is if you're watching this and you are a patient who has an autoimmune problem, a lot of this is going to be things you've read about, heard about, wondered about, been confused about. So we're going to try and clean up as much as we can. Dr. Gates and I were to a 36-hour seminar 
uh, which I think turned into a 50-hour <laughs> seminar, uh, in, in, for one whole week in, uh, um, in uh, September up in Portland. And I think we're going to try to condense that into the next 45 minutes. So, so we seem like we're, like we're like rolling on this. Uh, uh, we are. So we have there, there. So there are a lot of different things that are uh, involved in addressing the autoimmune patient. Now I'm just going to say the autoimmune patient. I don't care what autoimmune problem you have. Uh, I, I know we said we're going to discuss all the autoimmune problems. We're not. <laughs> we just discussed them. And here's what we discussed. If you have a confirmed autoimmune problem, that might be something that we want to address too, because we actually had a lady come in here a couple months ago, and she clearly had rheumatoid arthritis, and her hands had the rheumatoid arthritis uh, 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 presentation. You could look at the uh, erosive arthritis in there. You could see the, all of the classic signs, but her rheumatoid arthritis factor came up negative. So the doctor said she didn't have it. Like, that doesn't wash, okay? And we might be able to explain that. In fact, we should explain that because that's a big confusion with a lot. And she actually thought she, maybe she didn't have a tar right. well, I think I have it. <laughs> well, like, you're right, you know? Okay, so in that so where do you want example, to with, I'll hit on that. Basically, there are clinical ways to diagnose rheumatoid arthritis, and there are laboratory ways, and there are radiographic ways, meaning x ray. So this lady did not fulfill the laboratory diagnosis for rheumatoid arthritis. Her rheumatoid arthritis factor was negative as well as something called a CCP antibody. Those are negative. So her doctor said, okay, you can talk a little slower. Sorry. <laughs> her CCP antibody was also negative. That's just a very specific antibody that is seen in rheumatoid arthritis patients. So she was told she didn't have it. However, she fulfilled all of the clinical as well as radiographic criteria for having rheumatoid arthritis. This underlies some of the complexity of dealing with autoimmune patients because the lab testing is not perfect. There is something called sensitivity and specificity. And basically it just means if we have a lab test, a certain number of those people are going to have a false positive and a certain number of those people are going to have a false negative. And so there's no perfect lab exactly. test. Exactly. There's no perfect lab test. So you can have a lab test and be told it's normal and it's not. And they range in sensitivity and specificity. Sometimes it's up around 90%, sometimes it's down around 50%. And so there create in that there's a lot of ambiguity. Now I want to back up and just say a few more things relative yeah. to your, your introduction. Basically, everybody needs to understand that our immune system is designed never to kill us. <clears throat> there are millions of mechanisms, millions of, think of it this way, checks and balances in the immune system. So that if we have an immune cell that wants to kill, let's say, our pancreas or diabetes or our thyroid, that the other immune cells will come in and wipe that guy out and kill him. However, it's becoming more and more common in our population to have these autoimmune disorders. We're now seeing 10% of the population has Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is where the immune system kills the thyroid. So it's very, very interesting from one standpoint, but also uh, from a clinical standpoint where we're trying to help patients with this, we have to get to the underlying causes, as Dr. Rutherford was saying. And those causes can be complex and many, and depending on the type of autoimmune disorder, can vary a little bit, but as Dr. Rutherford also said, there tends to be these, these common tenets that we're seeing. If you address certain areas of our physiology, we can change the immune system because maybe the immune system is located primarily in one area of your body. And I think out of that, we'll, we'll go into that in greater detail. But I also want to say, <clears throat> when we were up in Portland, Dr. Vasquez, who put on the seminar, he has written a book called Integrative Rheumatology. And it's a fantastic book. I think anybody out there with a autoimmune disorder should get it, just to get a feel for what is actually known about how we can change the immune system naturally, through diet, through supplementation. Sometimes certain medications are needed, but there are more medications that are used to affect like, the gut. Right. Rather than putting somebody on methotrexate right. and completely squashing their immune system. That's not a judge on methotrexate or Actimra or these drugs because for the longest time that's all that's been available. And so if that helps somebody with rheumatoid arthritis, awesome. But what we're here is we're seeing some really cool things relative to maybe calming down the immune system so a person has a better quality of life yeah. naturally. Yeah. And so and again, so so we'll dovetail off of each other. Uh, from a more practical perspective, and, and I've listened to yeah, a couple thousand consultations at this point in time, 
we do, I do con a consultation with the patient initially to try to determine if that patient has the ability to do the types of things needed to, to turn themselves around because it's, it's almost becoming obvious, yes, we have autoimmune problems, yes, there's a genetic propensity in certain people for it, like me, my mother probably had Hashimoto's, my uncle had uh, multiple sclerosis, but, you know, there are people who can have that in their family and go through their whole life without having a, an autoimmune problem, even if they get a trigger, even if they get in a car accident, or even if they have children. We're finding, we're finding uh, that there are like about seven different categories of, 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 of how to address this, but the biggest things I see is stress for sure. We are we're the most stressed out society on planet Earth, bar none, and that, that's in the literature. I'm not even going to get into that, but I mean we are the most stressed out I mean, we have two jobs, and now we, we've gone through the recession, and we have, we're changing societies, we're changing roles, um, you know, we're arguing over school. I mean, this is a stressed out society. Stress is a huge factor in perpetuating autoimmune problems, and we'll, and we'll, dis and we'll discuss that. We're, I, we're also seeing, you know, we hear these histories all day long. Um, uh, again, I'm, I was stunned to hear all about all the sexual, I mean, it's unbelievable. Oh, I was sexually abused, I was verbally abused, I was beaten. This stuff goes under stress. And I'll tell you what, it, it, it like never goes away. It, it goes in there and it creates chemical problems, it creates mechanisms that cause t things that we're going to talk about, high cortisol levels, uh, imbalances in your blood sugar, and ability to lose. I, believe it or not, I mean, that stuff stays with you forever. Um, we could, I, we might do maybe a 10 minute segment on that because mm -hmm. uh, people need to understand how and why that is because it's so important, it's such an important part of your recovery. But uh, antibiotics, tons and tons and tons and tons of antibiotics wiping out people's uh, gut floras. Your kid, you have your kid, your kid gets the ear infection, next thing you know you go through two, three, four, five, six of these series of antibiotics, it wipes out their gut flora. You're going to find out in the next uh, 45 minutes or so, or um, how important the gut is to this, um, and and you're going to find out how it's a big piece to the puzzle, and you're going to find out how stress is a piece to the puzzle. Neither one of them is the entire answer. In and of themselves, both of you will make they'll make you feel better. But I, I I you know I with the little time I have I I enjoy going out to the golf course. It's kind of nice out there. So I'm walking around on a golf course after I'm done walking around the golf course, and my legs itch from all the chemicals that they have on there. I see guys put the ball in their mouth to clean it off. I'm like, really? Are you serious? Do you know what's you know the toxins that are on there? So we have toxins. We have toxins out there, um, in uh, and that and that kind of and that kind of de-stresses me a little bit. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're out there and you're thinking everything's really great and everything's really nice and you're out there on a golf course and, and you're getting all this, all these toxins coming at you and, and things of that nature. Um, we have, uh, but before you go out on the golf course, there is this uh, wicker basket in the men's uh, locker room that has all these non-steroidal anti-inflammatories so that you can take those so that you don't hurt while you're golfing. <laughs> and they damage everything. They damage your stomach, they damage your intestines, they, they damage your cells ability to function normally relative to certain chemicals. And I mean this is our society right now. And then we have food, and then we have everybody going to McDonald's and those times. People are becoming much, much more aware of it. But even I have people that come in here and say we give people a baseline diet that we use to uh, help to assess once they're on that for a week or two. We can kind of assess their reaction to treatment and, and determine things about their food. But there are people coming here and look at that diet and go, why eat better now? But I, I actually eat better than your diet. I don't eat anything wrong. So there's, there's issues with the food. There's who's eating who's eaten this diet, who's eaten the paleo diet and they're off grains, who's, who's eaten the Mediterranean diet but they're not off grains, who has allergies to grains, who has that. So, so you have the crappy food but you also have the genetically altered food and there's a lot of, we did a thing on gluten so you can look back on that because that's a whole, we did an hour on that and that wasn't enough, that's a whole different thing. So, so we have the food going on, we have infections, I was just joking with Dr. Uh, Gates before we came on, I was <laughs> I was cleaning out under my fingernail, and, and and I said, 
we ought to do something while we need to eat more dirt, right? Mm -hmm. So that our because there are theories out there that we're a little too clean, that that and that makes us susceptible to more infections. And I happen to subscribe to that theory. That doesn't mean it's right, okay? But I so I I chew the dirt out from under my under, so that I know that I I'm getting my immune system up because I have part of it. But infections. You're you're hearing now where we're getting this MRSA. You're 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 hearing where we're getting uh, infections that are bad, bad, antibiotic resistant and so on and so forth. Nutrition. A lot of people are not are not getting the nutrients in. So if you're stressed out, you're fine. One of the things stress can do is is it can damage. And and believe me, all this has to do with autoimmune problems. We're gonna pull it all together here in a little bit. But all of that can uh, the, the stress that you go through can do a lot of things. One of the big things it can do is just damage the inside of your gut. It can ruin your ability to make hydrochloric acid. If you can't do that, you can't break down your food and you can't absorb it. You're not getting the nutrients. Next thing you know, you're the person who takes B vitamins and tells me your nerves feel better for 15 minutes because you're not getting any B vitamins in your system. So what was the cause? Was the cause that you weren't getting enough B vitamins or was the cause that you were stressed out of your mind? All I'm trying, and there's more, okay, but I'm trying to draw the general complexities. Within each of those categories, there's a lot of things that need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. So my main goal is not to make you more confused <laughs> or make you stressed. My main goal is to say all of those things have a solution. And for the most part, all of those entities have a non-drug solution. But it doesn't lend itself to going to the doctor, sitting there for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15, even an hour, and having that doctor evaluate you and then give you a baseline diet, give you a couple of supplements and say, okay, let's see how that works. All of those things need to be evaluated and preferably they need to be evaluated all at once and then they need to be understood in a hierarchy of which ones are the ones that are killing. Is it your gut that ha you know is, is the big problem that's attacking your immune system? Is it that you have these parasites that nobody thinks that they have in this country? I was just reading an article yesterday, uh, the local article, we're in Reno, Nevada, and the local Reno, Nevada government put out something to say, please pick up your dog crap, because um, there's a ton of parasites in there. Well, I don't eat dog crap. Well, you know what? Your dog eats dog crap. <laughs> and, <laughs> and your, your dog, dog comes up and licks at your face, <laughs> and the next thing you know, you wonder how you get a paragraph. And I don't want to be gross, but, you know. I used to work in restaurants when I was working my way through school, and uh, particularly today, you know, we're getting food from all over the place. There are people who don't wash their hands when they go into the bathroom. That's why they say, "Staff, yeah, you know, please wash your hands." I mean, there's a lot of parasites out there. So these are the things that that we see um, relative to all. What's what's the common thread among all of the things that we just got done talking about for the autoimmune patient? they all cause your immune system to fire up. Well, what are we trying to do? Here's the other confusion. You go to the vitamin store and the vitamin person there who's read their little sign on, on what they were told to say about this vitamin says, oh, you have an autoimmune problem. Here, you need to take this. It'll boost your immune system. Wrong. Wrong. You need to calm your immune system down. Balance it even, but you do not need to boost it because your immune system is already looking for things to kill like all day long. So if you get stressed, if you're in a food you're allergic to, if you go and take tox, if you go and take these 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 aspirins every day and this type of thing, they all if you get too much blood sugar, you got too little blood sugar, all of this stuff creates an effect that causes your immune system to have to go into action. And if you're an MS patient, it goes into action and what and it also attacks the myelin sheaths that are around your nerves. And if you have Hashimoto's it attacks your thyroid, and next thing you know, you got heart palpitations and internal anxiety, and you're feeling jittery, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, kind of an overview. Absolutely, it's great. Yeah. Anything? Well, I'm going to elaborate I on the stress on response for like hours. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to like dominate here. I want to sound like I know anything here, because because what we know is is what we know, but we also know there's other things that are not known, and we and, and every day is a new experience here. And, and new research on newer things to help and, 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 and things that are that are um, creating or triggering and then ultimately perpetuating your autoimmune problem. And you're not handling any of those if, if your basic line of attack is I'm taking prednisone or I'm taking methotrexate or whatever. I wonder if it'd be good if we could link the articles that I read every night to these broadcasts. 
on our Facebook page. Only if you got 10 hours to uh, read possible? the articles that take him about 20 okay. minutes. So we'll start read. doing yeah, that. That would yeah, be great. I have no life, just for the record. <laughs> so I read an hour and a half to two hours a night on these varieties of subjects. First of all, relative distress. We got to mention the book Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. We mention it every week. It's People written, are appreciative of it, yeah. so we mention it. So it's written by Robert Sapolsky. He is the world's foremost researcher on stress. He's at Stanford University. He's no slouch, and he has written one of the best books I've ever seen. Yes, it can be a little technical, but he talks at length about the effects of chronic stress on a human being and other primates, for example. But namely, we need to focus on human beings here. And as Dr. Rutherford was saying, when someone goes through an incredibly stressful circumstance as a child, that winds up their stress circuits in their brain. So they have a tendency to always elicit stressful responses throughout the remainder of their life, even though maybe it's not that stressful what they're going through compared to somebody else. And those stress responses produce cortisol, and cortisol can have uh, actions on the immune system in terms of imbalance. Produce it. too much cortisol. Mm -hmm. Now, there are two sides to the immune system that we haven't talked about. There's this Th1 side of the immune system, which refers to the side of the immune system that's kind of analogous to the Marine Corps. If there were a bacteria over here, they would go and do the rough and tough killing from a very simplistic perspective of that bacteria or virus. There's also something called a Th2 side of your immune system, which is more the precision killing side of your immune system. It remembers infections, things of that nature, and that's kind of analogous to the Air Force. Then there is something called a Th3 regulatory immune system, and that Th3 immune system is largely fueled by vitamin D. And we know that there's a vitamin D deficiency epidemic out there. And I've talked to many doctors who say, you know, everybody is deficient in vitamin D. I don't know what to do. Well, there's new studies coming out saying that we're so deficient in vitamin D because our immune system is so unbalanced yeah. and is chewing up all of our vitamin D. So that's a general perspective there on stress. So we got to get the book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. I think we should talk about hormones. To Dr. Degree. Gates emphasizes that because as we've developed our understanding of, of, of what we're doing with these chronic conditions and ultimately with these autoimmune conditions, um, once we started putting, well, we put a stress program in, we actually have a de-stressing room in our office where we put people in there and we de-stress them, but we teach some pretty good home uh, strategies that are very simple, some of them are in that book that he mentioned, our results uh, improved dramatically. Not only the people get better quicker, but they got better uh, overall results and better long-term results. I don't know, what, you're, what were you going to go over next? I was going to go over um, endocrinology. Okay, let's do that. What I was going to do is just go through each of you. We have, a, we have about seven things here that we're going to cover with you. If you have an autoimmune problem, You've either been exposed to these, you may be confused about it because of different conflicting data. Yeah, we're going to do our best to kind of, uh, or to kind of um, uh, uh, ferret things out for you, sort things out for you here. So we'll do endocrinology first. So what, what is the effect of hormones on the patient who has autoimmune problems and what is it and, and how do you, you know, how, does it, how is it involved in their recovery? Mm -hmm. And we, we need to do like three or four minutes on, either, on each of these. Okay. So the in, in essence, relative to endocrinology, we definitely see it in terms of estrogen metabolism. We know that the more estrogen someone has, the more likely they are in certain types of autoimmune diseases to have an autoimmune disease. They've talked about this extensively relative to Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And one of the um, proposed treatments that is talked about in the literature is to reduce estrogen because that can be a way to help the immune system to come more into balance. Now, in our clinical experience, so many of our patients have been on birth, birth control. control. Medications or hormone replacement therapy. Most of them not for birth control. Yeah, and many times they've been taking these medications for years, and these this chronic use of these hormone replacement therapies seem to have effects in terms of balancing the immune system. So uh, that is something that definitely goes through my mind in treating a new patients. Yeah, when I first Part started getting into that. this, my mentor, Dr. Vitis Karasian, if you ever see this doc, you know, we're giving you all your due credit right. here. Uh, he wrote a book called Why Do I Still Have Thyroid Symptoms When My Blood Tests Are Normal? Some of you will probably relate to that. But his one of his mantras, what he calls clinical pearls, is estrogen drives autoimmune problems. If you have too much estrogen, it's just like pouring gasoline on the fire. So, so it's one of the big keys 
um, that we um, are observant of immediately when we're doing our initial evaluation of an autoimmune patient. Do they have too much estrogen? Does a man have too much estrogen because he's doing something called aromatizing it, which which means he's turning his testosterone into into estrogen. Um, too much estrogen in a, in, a, in a female goes way past even exacerbating your immune problem. Um, and it can it can cause uh, high testosterone in a woman. And those of you who have any background in hormone replacement therapy know that's not good. That can cause a whole uh, a whole plethora, your your mm -hmm. favorite term, a whole lot of other problems. So so it's it is a big key. And for those of you who come in and, and think that you should start with the uh, endocrine system, there is a hierarchy to this. What we find is before we would, and I'm, and I'm going to kind of, before we would ever get to the endocrine system, um, we would uh, we would uh, probably evaluate a number of other things first because the endocrine system is kind of at the bottom of the stream. You need your adrenal glands, you need your stress glands. Now we're back to stress. Mm -hmm. So you need your stress glands to work right because if the stress glands don't work right, they can't take cholesterol, that bad cholesterol, that's another whole topic for another day. Uh, they can't take that cholesterol and put it together with these precursors and make estrogen. So what do you want to fix first? Well, first of all, you want to get off your frigging statin drugs that have your stuff down to I know, and he's going to stress out with me. Saying, <laughs> but this is a topic right now, okay? You, you look it up. You look up the data on this, all right? I'm not anti-medicine. I am pro people getting better, all right? But here's the point. If you have a statin drug and somebody's telling you you need your cholesterol down to 150, you're not going to be able to make these hormones. So, you, so that has to be handled. You need enough cholesterol to make the hormones, and then you need your stress glands to work right to make the hormones. Now, once all that's cleared out, if you still have too much estrogen, that needs to be handled directly. But a lot of times, it's handled before you get to that if you do it in the right order. And if it's not, it absolutely needs to be handled. Birth control, look up the Endocrine Society webpage, and they'll tell you how, then they'll tell you all about birth control and how great that is for you long term. Let me interject something like that. <laughs> so we'll say, if you're eating Big Macs every day, if you're eating the standard American diet, statins are probably a pretty good idea. But what we're talking about is our patient population, we have them on very stringent diets to where we try and control all the mechanisms behind cardiovascular right. disease right. naturally. And that's where we work with doctors on controlling statin medications. He's Just very careful. Just for the record. I'll do my thing on statin at some point in time <laughs> so that you get a better idea on it. When right? I'm on vacation. But, but that's fair. But that's Yeah, when he's on vacation. How about food? Food's huge. Food. I mean, food and autoimmune problems. I have a lot of people who like, cannot believe that food can affect them that much. Food. The big number one thing that people are kind of aware of these days because it's getting play on some of the big programs uh, is, is the gluten thing, um, the gluten uh, component of wheat, wheat allergies versus autoimmune. Just know this. You can look up our, um, our presentation on our website on gluten. You should because it's the only standard recommendation we have for autoimmune patients. It is highly exacerbative to the autoimmune patient. We have no other standard recommendation. If you come in here and you have, and there's five people coming here with rheumatoid arthritis, there's one standard recommendation everybody else is going to be fine-tuned relative to evaluation and history and, and findings, but the one is gluten. How about food allergy? Okay. Or you want to go on food gluten? I want to go on food And, for and, a and food allergies because a uh, 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 mantra that we have around here at Clinical Pearl is, is if you have a gluten sensitivity, in other words, if you get off gluten and you feel better, we don't really need to know if you have celiac. We don't really need to know if you have non-celiac specific sprue. We don't really need to know whether you got a gluten sensitivity. This all confuses the matter. You just need to never eat it again, okay? <laughs> End of story. But if that happens, then that's usually just the tip of the iceberg. Exactly. And Dr. Warren Cordain, <clears throat> the gentleman who invented the paleo diet, who was, we had the honor of listening to his very last, last lecture. And, you know, the paleo diet, just like so many things, there have been so many people have done you know, spin-offs on it. You know, they've made their version of paleo. He deserves the credit because he is he is a smart guy. Well, He's we got to see how he yeah. we got to see how he researched it. It was it was really it was ours and it was fun. It was amazing. Yeah, the data is almost inarguable. It is totally inarguable. <laughs> and the new data is showing that certain foods feed these weird and bad bacteria in our intestines. 
and we'll call it a small intestinal bowel overgrowth, just for uh, namesake. So anyway, certain foods, especially grains, seem to feed these bacteria. And so we're finding that, and we don't know what grains you're reacting to. It may just be gluten. It may be gluten and quinoa. Um, but these grains feed these bad bacteria, and then if these bad bacteria are there, they can create a lot of inflammation in our intestines and allow big molecules to be absorbed into our bloodstream. Okay, let's stop on that point. So if you eat a hamburger, that hamburger should be broken down into amino acids by the time it hits your small intestine, glucose, little fat molecules. That's really all that should be absorbed into your bloodstream. Big protein molecules from the gluten in the hamburger bun should not be absorbed in. But we're now seeing that is the case with this phenomenon of leaky gut syndrome, intestinal hyperpermeability is a better way to say it. And so now these proteins are leaking through and then that can activate the immune system against the foods that you're eating. And people will say, wow, just diet can help my autoimmune disease? Well, we observe Quite a bit. That. It can, yeah, Quite absolutely. A bit. But the diet has to be specific. And so, uh, and, and, and frankly, the uh, uh, paleo diet is probably a very good generic diet for an autoimmune patient to consider. But I had a gentleman that came in here yesterday and interviewed him. He's been on paleo diet for uh, three months now, and he feels better. But now it's kind of emphasizing a lot of the other things that are going on. So if you're on the paleo diet, you're off grains, you're, you're eating very cleanly, and you still have problems, then you're going to have this either leaky gut that Doc talks about, or you're going to have this small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. All of these things are doing what? They're firing up your immune system. And here's what you need to remember. When your immune system gets exacerbated, when it gets fired up, it's going to start attacking things. And if you have MS, you have a genetic propensity for it to attack the outer sheets, the outer myelin sheets of your, uh, of your nerves. If you have Hashimoto's, it's going to attack your thyroid. If you have celiac, but this is what we're talking about. Food can be very powerful, but again, we can have 100 people come in here and the maintenance diet that we will ultimately give them through some pretty tedious, <laughs> uh, I, I hate to use the term trial and error, but that's kind of what it is. Yeah, through some pretty tedious. And we have found, by the way, the food allergy testing to not be useful for us. Um, the allergy elimination diet, in our observation and experience, remains the most cost effective, <laughs> but, but truly it remains the most accurate one. And, I, and we think it's because most of our patients are autoimmune patients, their immune systems are already overreacting, you take that test, all, you're the patient who comes in here and says, here's my immune, here's my food allergy thing, I'm allergic to 24 foods or 56 foods. No, no, that's not the way it is. You're probably allergic to something, but you're so sensitive, I think that, and this is my opinion, and we've tried them, trust me, we've used them, they have been not been useful. We end up building an allergy elimination diet into, into what we do with our patients, and that seems to be by far the most accurate because when you reintroduce the foods, and it's tedious to reintroduce 20 foods in over a period of time, but it's worth it because our programs, well, that's the last thing we do with our patients. And our programs aren't over until that last food allergy is definitively defined. And then that creates your proper diet. So, you know, you know being off, do you have to be off of all grains? Maybe, maybe not. Do you have to be off of gluten? In our opinion, you should, all autoimmune patients should be off of gluten. That's our opinion based on results, okay? And uh, is it the Mediterranean diet? Is it the paleo diet? Uh, is it uh, all, any of these other diets, frankly, um, are probably not appropriate for the autoimmune patient. Any, 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 anything else other than those two probably aren't even appropriate. And even the Mediterranean diet has weaknesses, and even the paleo diet has weaknesses. It has to be, for the autoimmune patient, it has to be tailored to that person. So food is enormous. Food is enormous. You, you talked about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, um, infections, and inflammation. Another thing that fires up your immune system. So if you have a chronic infection, and for me, uh, I would go to viral infections. Mm -hmm. Maybe we talk about the fact that a lot of people who come in here who have autoimmune problems are fatigued. Um, so they've been to somebody who says it's the Epstein-Barr virus that's causing your problem. And certainly we have seen the Epstein-Barr virus be involved in a rather small percentage of our cases, would you say? Mm -hmm. Like, but, but so, 
So there are infections, there are infl and inflammation. Oh my God, inflammation. Everybody knows inflammation now. Everybody's taking their noni juice or their pomegranate juice or their whatever, okay, and feel better. Not a problem unless you have blood sugar problems. Well, they have you take a little shot at a time, mm -hmm. I think. But, um, but that's not getting to the cause of the problem. The cause of the problem is what's causing the infection. Exactly. Oh. Exactly. And so this is a really exciting area. He's this looking is, things up. That's why I said go. This is one of the most exciting areas, I think, this that's is huge. evolving in our practice because we've been good at a lot of things for a while, and now we're getting ah. better at, sorry, but we're getting better at this aspect of it. And so it depends He's on your autoimmune disease. He's getting all the time. <laughs> depends on the autoimmune disease. Let's it's pick, fun, though. Let's take rheumatoid arthritis. New data came out recently saying that we're seeing increased numbers of these weird bacteria called Prevotella species in rheumatoid arthritis patients, and the hypothesis is that the immune system is trying to kill these bad bacteria in the intestines, which is causing the immune system to get overreactive against the bacteria, and as a result, because that bacteria in essence looks like the cartilage of your joints, then your immune system starts attacking the cartilage, and that creates rheumatoid arthritis. There's also another bacteria involved called, I think it's Pseudomonas gingivalis, that's in the mouth of rheumatoid arthritis patients. So that's just interesting in and of itself. And now we're seeing, here's an article out of uh, Gut Microbes 2014 where they're talking about the segmental filamentous bacteria that Dr. Right. Vasquez was talking right. about at length. At that seminar we went to. These are these weird bacteria that you can't even culture, but you can see them on an electron microscope slide, which is like 100,000 times more powerful than the average microscope. And you can see these weird bacteria in there, and they're seeing that these bacteria cause the immune system to get overreactive, <clears throat> and they're hypothesizing that this could be involved with MS, and most rheumatology disorders, autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, things of that nature. And then we've talked about Hashimoto's thyroiditis, where new studies are showing that upwards of 80% of these Hashimoto's patients have human herpes virus 6 living <laughs> in their thyroid. And have we seen clinical results with doing certain types of viral treatments? Yeah. Yeah. We've seen phenomenal non drug results. viral treatments. After we've taken that patient through treatments for their intestines, for their food allergies, for their stress levels, and let's say they were better, but they weren't all the way better, then we did the viral treatment. And yeah, simple as uh, coconut extracts, vitamin mm -hmm. A, yeah. things of that mm -hmm. nature. Uh, but you have to know it's there. You have to know to look for it. Right. So if you're getting the idea this is complex, we want you to understand this is complex because your doctor's not thinking about these things. Only he stays up at night and reads about all these things. But frankly, the gentlemen and, and, and women, that one lady doctor that who mm -hmm. was pretty phenomenal, yeah. um, that we have affiliated with, um, whose name is failing me. Dr. Minich. Dr. Minich. Dr. Minich, you are awesome. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, these are the folks that, I mean, I think we were in that for a week relative to essentially even though it wasn't billed as an autoimmune seminar, and we were there for like 50 hours listening about toxins and grains and and all this different, all these different types of things, um, uh, it was it was essentially about what we treat. It was essentially about autoimmune problems, and, and it was like 50 hours, and 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 they covered uh, all of these things. And uh, these are not, but these are they're all literature research people. We probably reviewed, they probably reviewed over 2,000 peer-reviewed literature journals with us. Some of these things are not going to get to your doctors for 10 or 15 years, and they're not going to get to your doctors unless there's a drug for it. What did I just get done saying? You can knock it off. For me, it's vitamin A. I take, I take uh, a, quite a bit of beta carotene, actually. I'm a, I'm a vegetarian. I don't advocate all my patients become vegetarians by any means, okay? There's a reason I'm a vegetarian. Um, and uh, but for me, I take beta carotene, and uh, I don't take that within within a couple of, you know, within a week. I know that I haven't been taking it because it handles that virus uh, thing. It's a precursor to vitamin A. So, and inflammation. I would just like to say this about inflammation. How many things cause inflammation? You're taking some. You're taking you're taking aspirin <laughs> every day. Not my opinion. My opinion. <laughs> not a good thing to do. That's my opinion. Opinion. Okay, so don't go stop taking your aspirin unless you go talk to your doctor. There. So make it better. Beautiful. Okay. Beautiful. <laughs> and uh, but how many things cause inflammation? Lots. Lots. I remember when I was first sitting in class and somebody asked that question, I could think about three. Well, now I know there's like about three hundred. And I'm exaggerating, but if you have too high blood sugar, it causes inflammation when you have the 
when you have the the I fall asleep afterwards. If you have too low blood sugar, you get irritable and shaky. That causes inflammation. If you have too much iron in your system, that causes inflammation. I'm mentioning some things you probably don't have any idea if it's about parasites, um, uh, chronic infections in your gut, celiac. Uh, 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 oh my God! You know, I mean, go on. Mm -hmm. You know, how many you things cause inflammation? Yeah. So the 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 issue is, you can handle all those. Most people don't look for too much iron. We look for it in everybody because we see it a couple of times a month. If you have too much iron, what do you do? You go get blood. You get rid of that unless it's really bad. Unless you have something called hemochromatosis, then there's there's a way to handle that. But there's a way. The point is, there's a way to handle each one of these things. If you haven't been exposed to it because there's not a medication that's been made for it yet. Or they give you an anti-inflammatory, which temporarily gets rid of the, the inflammation, just like noni juice, but nobody says what's causing the inflammation. I can't tell you how many inflamed guts that I palpate every week. Just tons. And, and for the most part, they can all be gotten better. Crohn's disease. Those of you who have Crohn's disease. I mean, we, read, we saw something last week that said, this is a big study. It said, we have discovered that people who have Crohn's disease have more bad bacteria than people who don't. Even my patients kind of went like, really? You needed a study for, to tell you that? So what do they want to do? They want to, they want to get a drug that's only going to kill the bad bacteria. Guess what? There's already something that does that, and it's not a drug. So, so but inflammation. What you need to know is, is if you have inflammation, if you have an infection, if your food's off, uh, if you're if you have too much estrogen, and we're going to go on a little bit more. Um, I just got a little bit into nutritional supplements there, I guess, kind of. Um, then all of these things are firing up your immune system, and they are perpetuating your downward decline with your autoimmune problem. Our first goal here is just simply to stop the downward decline. The next step is then to reverse it to the degree that it can be reversed, and these are the things that have to be done. We've talked about stress. Um, I want to say one more thing. On, oh, please. On uh, infections. So I pulled up some really cool articles this morning, and they were talking about these bad bacteria causing diabetes type 1, which is really interesting. We know that type 1 oh, diabetes right. is an autoimmune disorder, but they're now saying there's a lack of these quote-unquote beta-hydroxybutyrate producing bacteria in the intestines of diabetic patients, which is another novel finding. Dr. Vasquez was talking about those beta hydroxybutyrate right. bacteria too. Right. So anyways, it's all out there. You need to know it. This is termed integrative rheumatology. Um, Dr. Vasquez wrote the book. We're going to start a training program for other alternative practitioners in this field. In all of our spare time. Relative but to rheumatology and we'll training in, in autoimmune diagnosis because this is what we treat. This is what we do and this is what keeps me up late at night because there's nothing more satisfying than modifying the it diet doesn't of a, keep me up late at night. <laughs> but then modifying the diet of a rheumatoid arthritis patient. Let me tell you, our rheumatoid arthritis patients eat a different diet than our other autoimmune disease patients right. like a Hashimoto's patient. Right. They just do because we found that they can't assimilate certain types of proteins. So anyways, where were you going to go next? Nutritional? So, and, well, let's go to nutrition. I just mentioned that there was an antibiotic out there that's non, uh, mm. that, that's very specific to bad bacteria. This will be our third book this year. And we have found it to be very effective. That was This was on uh, reading through much of the literature, going to lectures, and then ultimately saying, ooh, that looks, it looks like a piece of the puzzle that maybe some of our patients may not be getting well if we don't do that. And it's called berberine. Okay? Now, so all of you are going to go out and get berberine now if you have a stomach problem. Probably not a bad thing to do, but here's a point I want to make. Okay, and here's how it's presented because I just saw something come in the mail the other day, the new weight loss miracle, berberine. Well, that's fine because this small intestinal bacterial overgrowth that is a, a, a infectious, inflammationist type of a thing that we just talked about can cause you to have diabetes, that can cause you to have high blood pressure, that can cause you to have uh, inability to lose weight, it can cause you to, but it'll perpetuate your autoimmune problem. So that's fine. Go get it. But if you have, the point I want to make is about this bullet theory of, okay, we're going to give you a drug or we're going to give you a nutrition. I've had lots of people who have come in who have taken that. And I said, well, they get to the point in the treatment where we're going to give it to them. I go, uh, I already took that. It didn't work. Well, it didn't work because you didn't handle, we didn't, you didn't get something to handle your stress mechanism. We didn't find out what the infection was. You're eating the wrong diet. 
you have too much estrogen in your system and or you have toxins or you're eating the wrong nutritional supplements. That's what I'm saying. It's a full picture for each autoimmune problem. These problems are complex. Every autoimmune problem, you don't have just one, guaranteed. If, you, if you've been diagnosed with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, I will guarantee you, you have other tissues that are being attacked. Might be your thyroid, might be your gut, might be your cerebellum, might be your muscles, and you may not know that. Okay, as a re, as a result, you don't know what tissues are being attacked. Your but that can more or less kind of be figured out if you know what you're looking for. So you have to know to look for all of these things all at once. That's really the initial key to success. To know what so we so to have a structured program to look for all that at once and it doesn't mean ten thousand dollars worth of testing or doesn't have to mean that that's for sure I mean I think our testing is like around 500 600 400 bucks right. something like that um, and 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 I mean and with along with the history and along with the neurology uh, the neurological evaluations and the general systems evaluation that that is done that gives us most of, of what we need so it, it, so, you, but you need, to, but again, you need a structured way of looking at things. Somebody else may have a different structure to look for it this way. This is the, this is what we put together, and, it, and it's very sufficient for us. So, I wanted to make that point. I, I'm, I'm, I'm probably never going to get on Dr. Oz's show because by the time I'm done saying this guy's been a big pain in the butt for us, because he has been. He goes on a couple weeks ago, and he says, "Well, the big, the gluten thing is 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 baloney." The audience went ballistic. It's a scam. It's a scam. He said it's a scam. The audience went ballistic. But a lot of people, including our patients, heard that. And that is not a scam. He doesn't treat patients. He doesn't get to sit in the rooms and see what happens when a person changes their diet. Even the patients don't believe it. It's not psychosomatic. It's huge. And so and so we have patients, we have people out there giving all this bad data out there. And it's really the environment in which our patients are living, and it gives us more of a problem than trying to figure out just with a, but with it with a with an organized approach as to what's going on. But if, if somebody takes even one important piece away, it could sabotage the whole recovery. So um, so okay, the next thing you, we we're going to go into is we started on nutritional supplements, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I and I went on to the berberine, and I tried to make the point of berberine can be a part of your program. It may not be a part part of your program. Vitamin A may be a part of your program if you have a viral infection that's actually involved. I go back to Epstein Barr viruses. If I took 100 people running around out there and check them for Epstein Barr virus, probably 70% of them would have it. For those of you who don't know about Epstein Barr virus, it was the number one thing that was considered to cause chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, it's not, it, but it can be a player, and we find that it's a player in autoimmune patients. What? So we'll do the test. We'll see the Epstein Barr virus, but it's way down on the list of things that are are are, are exacerbators to what's attacking your system. And so we handle all these things first. And if the fatigue's gone, then we know that the Epstein Barr virus is just there. It's not a player. It's not a factor. But if it's there and it's a factor, coconut dish tracts, uh, vitamin A, and, mm -hmm. and and there are other things. Yeah, but it's again. Just trying to draw the picture of how of what you're up against or what what you know. But like you said, you know, a lot of people who have rheumatoid arthritis come in taking garlic. They're taking high doses of vitamin C, which may be okay and it may not. It may be imbalancing that side of their immune system. Or someone with allergic rhinitis, allergies, asthma, they're taking uh, resveratrol and they're taking grapeseed extract, and those things may not be congruent with their type of autoimmune disorder. So now they're drinking getting, a ton of caffeine. Yeah. So now we're tea. getting into the crapshoot of <clears throat> self-medication with supplements because. That was going to be my segue to Dr. Oz, but that's cool mm -hmm. because you get these bits and pieces. And when we're done, when we're done with our patients, what we do is, is we say, okay, we figured all this out. We say, here's your maintenance program. Don't do anything different than this. If we told you not to drink coffee, don't drink it. If we told you to drink it, don't you know, drink it. If we told you not to take this vitamin, don't take it. Don't listen to Dr. Oz. Don't listen to the guy who sells ProTandem. I, I'm not saying ProTandem is bad. Yeah, I'm just saying that I've had patients. We had, we, had, we had an AIDS patient. We had an AIDS patient who basically his doctors was telling him he was crazy to do the types of things that we're talking about. 
Um, six months later, they said, whatever these people are doing, keep doing it because we've never seen a recovery like this. This gentleman goes out and his neighbor is a chiropractor. I'm a chiropractor, so don't get me wrong. His neighbor is a chiropractor. He's about to retire and he's selling ProTandem. One of my closest friends sells ProTandem, so I'm not against ProTandem. But what we find out is a lot of these things are a crapshoot for the autoimmune patient. And even ProTandem, the company, will say that. They do say that. Autoimmune patient should But he that. didn't say that until right. after we beat right. him up and said, yeah. what, what, you know, what is actually the deal on this? And they did say that. So the bottom line is, is, is the, the bottom line for me is, is protandem is not bad, but protandem will exacerbate certain t parts of the immune system. Remember, what do we say? We need to have, will we'll boost, I won't use the term exacerbate, will boost certain parts of the immune system, which for you may be not a good thing. Okay, so I, and I think the important point to hit is where you are going, which is, it's a crapshoot. So people, some people are shocked when I say, stop drinking the green tea. Mm -hmm. That's for them because they have a TH2 system that is the Air Force, as you put it before, that is already over firing. Well, we don't need it to fire more and kill more things. And green tea with its antioxidants is boosting it up. But everybody says green tea is good, not for the autoimmune, not for all autoimmune patients. For some autoimmune patients, it's very good. For others, it's bad. Now, this may seem counterintuitive, but again, my goal here was to bring the complexities of what you're up against. And I think this might bring a little clarity to you because when I say these things, some people go, you know what, I've been drinking that green tea and I feel like crap. You know, and I stopped drinking and I felt better. It's like, well, yeah, that's a pretty good that's a pretty good barometer of, of what to do, but mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I think exactly. Trace. And so it's so common in the vitamin world. These people are just taking all these different supplements. We've had patients bring in bags, bags of supplements, bags, and not knowing what is doing what, and they take a little bit here and a little bit there, which is fine. But that's not how we operate. We operate in a very controlled, meticulous fashion. It's not how we operate, but the, but the point is, is, is that it, it, it's important for you to know this, this polypharmacy thing where you're taking too many drugs also goes for that. It also goes for the vitamin world. I'll make some more friends right now. You know, vi the vitamin world is still selling vitamins, okay? It's just like, but they're not as dangerous as, as, as taking too many drugs. And, but one of our biggest challenges is the patient who comes in here with a bag of 95 vitamins, and they're, and, and they're getting worse, and they've been getting worse for years, but they don't want to get rid of these vitamins. One of the very first things we do before we start care is we look at all the vitamins and say, this one's got to go, this one's got to go, this one can stay, not because it's helping them, but it's not going to interfere with, with their problem, and we don't want the person to like have withdrawal symptoms. But it's, and, and, and in fact, I'll, take, I'll go one step further. With our autoimmune patients, uh, our mantra is kind of less is more. Mm -hmm. I mean, we try and do as much with as little as we can. You know, we use supplements along the way, but most autoimmune patients are somewhat sensitive to drugs and to supplementation. I know I am. I can't just be taking anything. It'll, I'll have a reaction to it. So, you know, if you're that person who's out there and you're taking 20 vitamins a day because you read this one in prevention and you read this one in health magazines and you saw this one on television and you saw this one here and your neighbor sold you that, bad thing. I can tell you right now, um, that is a recipe for disaster for you. You might actually be exacerbating what you're doing. And then, so, and then I think the last thing that we've seen um, is toxins. And the, again, to revamp all of these different subjects, are subjects that we're covering because all of these can be contributing to exacerbating and promoting the attack on whatever tissue you're having attacked based on your specific immune system and removing all that, figuring all that, calming all that down, getting rid of the things. That is your role to that is your route to success versus taking the medication. The medication is much simpler. <laughs> kind of the rule of life. If it's harder it's probably better, <laughs> you know, and so toxins, uh, that's kind of a, mm -hmm. a fair one. Yeah, and basically... It's not the through... biggest one as big as I thought it was going to be when I started getting into this, but it definitely is a Yeah, it's a issue. player in autoimmune disease, and most rheumatology textbooks will say, you know, behind the causes of this disorder, it can be a bacteria, we think there may be viral components as well as toxic exposures. But then they say period, and then they go into chapters of how they're going to modulate the immune system with these heavy-duty medications we alluded to earlier in the broadcast. 
So relative to toxins, what's now being discussed is that if we're accumulating certain toxins, we're not flushing them out of our liver and our other tissues, that can be a trigger for our immune system to start turning on us. And we have worked with other detox facilities. We had a patient who had this severe allergic disorder where she would pass out. And it ultimately took her having to go to North Carolina where they put her through this huge detox regime where she was in a sauna. That's all they did. So many hours a day yeah. and pumping her full of certain products. And that was what led her to getting better, ultimately. Yeah. Going to but the that's more, and that, that severity of toxic intervention is probably more the exception of it. Yeah, exactly. We found, what I found to great relief was most toxins can be pretty well gotten rid of through kind of pro, some much simpler processes than that and much simpler processes than even chelation. There's some, uh, there's some challenge to the metals. There's yes. some challenge to the metals, which we won't get into right now. That has to do with once the metals are mobilized in, into your bloodstream, depending on if you have um, susceptibilities in your brain tissue, that could be not a good thing. So to cavalierly be doing chelation may not be a good thing for you folks. Uh, a little hint might be is if some of you are out there and you're taking things like GABA to go to sleep or relax and it's working, you probably shouldn't be doing chelation because it means that GABA shouldn't be getting through your bloodstream to your brain. If it's getting through and you start mobilizing toxins into your system, that's going to get through too. That's kind of a uniqueness that we've seen. But for the most part, what relieved me was, yes, toxins can be a big player. Um, patients like that are extreme. And they're, they're much less in the minority. Um, it, it's good to detoxify. But again, just detoxifying without figuring out your foods, without figuring out your nutrition, without, without getting uh, your stress handled, I'm not, we're not going to get into dysfunctional mitochondria at this point because we're already maybe five, eight minutes over where we yeah. want to be. Um, but if you don't handle all those other things, you'll feel better for a little bit, and then you won't feel better. So um, so now our producer just walked out of the room, so I don't know. If I think should... because we had some loud background noise. Okay. Yeah, some people were locking down. Okay, but so, in essence, that's the... So I don't know if we, sh if we can wrap it up at this point. <laughs> I think we'll start wrapping it up. Or we should wrap it up. Why don't we do that? Okay, so, so for the autoimmune disease patient out there who's taking medications most likely to suppress their immune system, just know that new natural means are, are coming about in the literature as well as clinical practice that are helping patients with autoimmune disease from a variety of mechanisms, whether it be by modulating diet, by getting rid of infections in their system, by changing their stress levels, by looking at their hormone levels or getting rid of toxins, all of those factors to help them live a better quality of life, maybe with less medication with the cooperation of their doctor. So that's how it's said. That pretty much says it. Okay. So thanks for viewing. Um, if you're interested in any of our other topics, uh, please, uh, we have a, a website, or we have a, is it a website? <laughs> PowerHealthTalk.com, where you can, you can investigate a lot of the other things that we've alluded to. We just try to bring you what we're learning as we're learning it and what seems to be successful with the type of patients that we're addressing on that particular week. So if you're interested in that, please feel free to go to that website. And we hope you enjoyed this. Please give us any feedback. Um, we're open to feedback. We don't want to waste your time. We want to give you data that's important to you. And uh, we will see you next week at this time, hopefully okay. with a shorter topic. <laughs> Thanks for